So I have to do the obligatory and semi-obvious show of hands. Who has not been to post before? So most people, all right. Most people have been to post and I see uh, some familiar faces. Um, today we're going to talk predominantly about just some of the some of the experiences that we all have in the weeds dealing with uh, post-production workflows, specifically with reality television in mind. So I'm going to begin by just introducing who we are. Um, we have three facilities currently in New York City. Uh, we've been at it for uh, over 15 years. Um, there are currently two post production facilities, one in the West Village, uh, the building that you're currently in, and our technical New York, our technical post uh, facility not far away on New York Street. Uh, in this building alone, there are over 120 avid editing rooms. Well, editing rooms, but the majority of them are at the Pacific. Uh, we are currently spanning five floors, over 120,000 square feet. It's a, it's a big shop. Um, across the whole fleet, there is well over 300 terabytes of Unity and ISIS storage. I think that's a lot. I still think it's a lot. Um, and uh, we actually figured out that, I sat down with the IT team at one point, and we actually figured out that there are just under 15 miles of 62.5 micrometer fiber optic cable laced throughout the entire building. So the whole philosophy going back to 10 years when we got started in this location was that pretty much any place could be a place for, for access to the media. Maybe it's an editing system, maybe it's a log or a transcribe system, who knows. But as long as you've got that lovely orange cable landing in, even in this very kitchen, you could put some kind of creative tool, probably an editing tool, maybe it's a, a logging station. Um, and with that, you really have an enormous amount of flexibility just in this very location, and that's pretty much the same philosophy that we've adapted in, in our other locations. Uh, we also have, um, across the three locations, we have added critical mix rooms, and recently uh, we've added the an ADR stage. Uh, and also between the two locations, Technical in New York, uh, Technical Post Works in New York, and here we have about 20 uh, Final Color studios, and including four, or I should say, excuse me, three digital cinema finishing theaters. Um, we have a very large rental fleet. So we are capable of deploying specifically Avid editorial systems and Unity or ISIS storage literally anywhere in the world. Um, I believe the fleet is now at around 600 systems, uh, and that includes uh, storage systems. So we can pretty much go anywhere. Um, we really tackle three different segments. We have a, um, we do a tremendous amount of scripted television. These are some of the clients, uh, some old, some recent. We also do a tremendous amount of feature film. Um, these are also some clients, old and recent. But tonight we're here to talk about unscripted TV, spanning reality television, science and nature, uh, and docu-soap. So there's a good chance that some of you are affiliated with these shows and you've probably done some of these shows on this floor, in this building, down the hall. Uh, there's been a lot of unscripted, non-fiction reality television uh, in, this, in this building. Okay, so what is it that makes reality television absolutely unique and entirely different from any other workflow out there, <clears throat> specifically feature films or scripted television. And that is the shooting ratio. So in July of last year, we were approached by one of our production companies based in this building that they had a new show that they were embarking on. And they told us that they were going to be shooting about 3,000 hours of footage <laughs> over the course of 12 weeks. And we kind of chuckled and thought, oh, that's a really high number. Uh, and we figured out that that was a shooting ratio of about 400, 501. At that point, that represented a record. When the dust settled and the show was complete, they had shot 4,300 hours of footage for eight one-hour episodes. Now keep in mind, one hour is actually 44 minutes. So if you want to be particular about it, that amount of content from 4,300 hours of footage is over 700 to one. I don't know about you guys, but for us, that was a, that was a, a high water mark. Anybody have shooting ratios higher than that? I wouldn't be surprised. Maybe I'd be surprised. I would be surprised. All right, so what does that mean if you shoot 700 to 1? How, in God's name, did they get there? How do you acquire 4,300 hours of footage? Well, it's actually not that hard. If you have six cameras, <coughs> 300 cameras, shooting 8 to 10 hours a day, six days a week, for 12 weeks, excluding interviews, and you know the requisite GoPro or 5D or 7D pickups that they did later in the season, you'll reach about 4,300 hours of footage. may not have been exactly that, but it was certainly in that, in that area. So at that codec, at that Canon XF codec, which is about 24 gigs an hour, that works out to about a little over 100 terabytes. That data has to go somewhere. It can't just exist in the ether, it must live somewhere. And that, as I was saying earlier, is one of the things that absolutely defines anyone working in reality television. You have more data than anybody else. 
why you would ever be that masochistic, well, we're going to talk about that. Why would you ever need to shoot that much? Well, in many respects, considering the success of the show, it's now in its, in its second season, there was a reason for it. They actually needed that kind of courage in order to extract the pieces to tell the story. So once you embark on shooting that amount of content with that kind of shooting ratio, now you're faced with a very serious decision tree. What exactly are you going to do with that content? So the first decision that you're going to make is how are you going to cut it? Are you going to work in standard definition, meaning a proxy? Or are you going to work with the camera original in its native codec? Or are you going to transfer to something? Well, you can probably guess what the answer was, and to this day still is. For most reality TV shows, and anyone working in this, in this sphere, no pun intended, anyone working in this sector knows that there's a good chance you're going to be working either with proxies, either with the Exicam proxies that come off of that camera, if the camera system itself actually reports proxies, or you are going to be creating proxies that probably, in an average environment, will be a standard definition media file. Well, that means that's a lot of processing time. It's not necessarily computationally expensive to do, but considering the volume of material, it does take a long time. You have other choices, though. You could cut natively, and cutting natively means that you are essentially copying the raw camera data without changing the codec. You're maintaining the codec, and in that other context, you're consolidating. So if it's Canon XF on the camera, it's Canon XF in the editing tool. That's called cutting natively. The value to that we're going to talk about in, in this presentation, but as most of you can imagine, or you can count in your own experiences, the value to cutting natively is that there's no conform. You don't have to reprint. You don't have to match back to the original camera source. And there's some value to doing that, except for the fact that now your, your overall storage footprint is going to be dramatically larger. <coughs> so once you've reached that basic decision tree about how you're going to go through the editorial process. And like I said, for these kinds of shooting ratios, and for most of the shows that you're doing, there's a good chance that you're going to be cutting in standard definition. So if you're in a 2398 project or a 24 frame project, it's 14 to 1. If you're in a 2997 project or something to that effect, it's probably 20 to 1 or 50 to 1 S. If you are in the business of ingesting that footage, these are numbers that will resonate with you, I'm sure. Um, anyway, so once you get going, um, from that point on, Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, I wanted to talk more specifically about some of the other things that are affecting reality TV shows on this level that are working at this scope. And we're noticing that a lot of the fundamentals, a lot of the paradigms, I guess, that are really typically associated with feature filmmakers have in a funny way trickled down. So, so these are some of the things that used to be really part of the world of filmmakers. 24 piece photography, that's the way it's been done for the last 100 years. Interchangeable lenses, shallow depth of field, that has been the purview of scripted television feature films. All of a sudden, the last five years, now we've seen camera systems that are not only more affordable, but start to give us the capability to shoot in a way that before was really accessible only to filmmakers with larger budgets and more expensive camera systems. So undoubtedly, everyone here has at some point worked with either a Canon camera or a Sony camera that five years ago was a half-inch sensor, a two-thirds two -thirds inch sensor. And back then, a two-thirds inch sensor, that was a big deal. But now the Canon 5D, 7D, C300, and more recently the F5 and 55 cameras, now they have um, full range sensors. So now you have either a full 55 millimeter sensor or a 4K sensor. That's larger than what you've ever had accessible to you in a camera body that's less than $10,000. The other more recent phenomenon that we've seen, in fact, there's a client down the hall on this very floor uh, that brought this to our attention semi-recently, is the ability to shoot in log. And I'll talk more about what that means and why, why with this kind of masochism in mind, why, why would you ever do that and what is the value add and, and, and what are the ramifications of shooting in log? And of course, more recently, everybody's talking about 4K. So should you shoot in 4K? What does that mean for your storage footprint? How does that affect processing time, ingest time, conform time, and so on? All right, so let's talk about, by the way, if people have questions, feel free to jump in with questions. Anytime. So, um, Let's talk about log photography, logarithmic photography, why anyone would shoot that way. Um, has, anybody, has anybody shot in log for unscripted projects thus far? Not yet. Right, well, there's somebody down the hall who's doing it now. Um, I would not be surprised if this becomes more common. Shooting in log, well, typically when you shoot with a traditional compressed HD camera, you're shooting in Rec. 709. Rec. 709 historically was a sufficient <coughs> representation of what that camera sensor could provide. Now you have digital cinema camera systems that actually give you a much broader dynamic range. And if you shoot with one of those camera systems in Rec. 709, you're actually not, even though this is not necessarily negative, you're not actually capturing 
the, the full spectrum of what that sensor can provide. This is why scripted TV and feature film folks are typically shooting in long, because what they want to do is they want to get as much as they can in terms of the overall uh, dynamic range, what that <coughs> sensor can provide. I don't know who that is. But, uh, <laughs> so, shooting in Rec. 79 usually means that it looks quote unquote normal. <coughs> shooting in log, however, is something more like this. So, if you shoot in log, rather than making a decision or a choice to where the, the, um, the darker areas of the frame and the brighter areas of the frame are landing, instead, the camera system is capturing the full range of the sensor, or as close to the full range of the sensor as the color in place can allow. The benefit to that is you have more options in your final color track. The downside is that it looks like that. So if you don't treat the footage or go through a daily process beforehand, that's what it's going to look like. So every DVD you produce or a producer cut that you make or a, or a H.264 QuickTime that you send to the network is going to look like that unless you apply a color track, which sounds easy, but it may not necessarily be easy if you have 4,300 hours of footage. So this is one of the big decisions that has started to trickle down with some of the reality TV production companies that we support in this building every day is, should you shoot this way? Uh, the good news is, and I'm sure Ian's going to talk about this, is that in version 7, you now have the ability to apply what's known as a lookup table, which is a color transform. So from a look like this, it becomes a look like that. You could do that in earlier versions of software. Even if the software did not support it, there would be a way to do it. But it's a little bit more cumbersome. And the last thing you want is anything that's cumbersome if you have 4,300 hours of footage. So one of the, the, the very desired and very long-awaited uh, aspects to working in Media Composer is now the ability to apply these transforms to your material at the ingest stage. You don't have to string it out necessarily into a timeline and apply some kind of color effect just to make it look like what you're looking at. So does it <coughs> provide value to the end product? Well, that's obviously a subjective thing. Um, my suspicion is that for certain kinds of content, it may actually provide enormous value. Uh, aerial footage, for example, or uh, footage that is, uh, a lot of the science and nature folks are starting to shoot in log, because if they're shooting a volcano from a helicopter, they actually, they really do want the very best they possibly can get out of that image, and they're probably putting a more expensive camera system in that helicopter if they're going to the trouble of doing it in the first place. So some of the specialty footage that we're seeing with the reality TV shows and the science and nature shows are shooting with those kinds of camera systems and they are shooting long. Thus far, we're not seeing the majority of the footage uh, get shot this way, but I wanted to bring it up because I, won't be, I wouldn't be surprised uh, in, in your next show or your next production that this kind of issue comes up, or this kind of question comes up. Now what about 4K? Yes? Just one question. If you adjust that, if you adjust the shoot <coughs> and adjust it using that corrected filter, you still have the same access to the latitude that you shot in log or original. No, you don't. But that might be okay for offline editorial. So if you apply a color transform during the ingest stage, assuming, my answer is predicated on you're doing a traditional offline edit. So if you're doing an offline edit and you're looking, working in low resolution, then it doesn't really make a huge difference. The color transform, the basic lookup table, is there to make it look normal, for lack of a better way of putting it. The original camera material, though, still Look, it, 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 you're not changing the original material. So when you go to an online, you're doing a conform, you're matching back to the camera original, and now you're back to having all the latitude of the original file, and now you have a little bit more creative flexibility to getting the look out that you want, getting the look out of the material that you want. Sydney. Um, I would be interested in finding out what type of file formats you would then end up with, SGI and Cineon, or that's like, I guess, a feature film? That's a very good question. Mm -hmm. You wouldn't get um, SGI or DPX or Cine on the file format because the media that you create is a function of the editing tool that's printing the media. Mm -hmm. So if I shoot on, say, F55, for example, uh, and I shoot in log, keep in mind log is not a file. Log is a look. Mm -hmm. It could be any file. It could be a QuickTime. It could be MXF. It could be truly anything, any file type and any codec. But log is a function of the way the camera printed the media in terms of the visual look. Mm. It's not a file type. So if you ingest into Media Composer, for example, you're getting MXF Media, mm. standard F or IDA. Okay. So it would still be it would still be pick your codec wrapped in MXF. Thank you. Does that make sense? Mm. Okay. 4K is probably a little bit 
more accessible to a lot of the reality TV shows that we're working with now. We have vlog photography. Vlog is still kind of one of those things that not everybody has their head around it. I don't blame them. It is actually pretty difficult to think about in terms of what the ramifications are for a budget. But what about 4K? What does that mean, for that matter? Well, I guess we would have to define what that means by the camera that's shooting it. The camera system that is probably most espousing 4K is the Sony guys. So the Sony guys, you know, turning on the point of view, Sony is very interested, and this is not negative, Sony is very interested in promoting their line of consumer television, which are 4K. And in order to justify that, they have to have 4K content. Some of the reality TV folks are interested in this too. One of the clients on this floor is now shooting in 4K because they want to do what are known as punches. They want to not make decisions about the actual framing of the material until they reach uh, the post-production process. So if you have a 4096 by 2160 frame, that's an enormous frame, you can actually do a, a pan and zoom or a pan and scan, I should say, across the image and extract the 60 by 90 part of the frame that you actually want to use. Now, one might argue, I might argue, that it might behoove you to make decisions on framing ahead of time if you want to avoid something like that. So if you're shooting in 4K raw on an F55 or an F5, that's about 500 gigs an hour. So just for a moment, think about the earlier shooting ratio of 700 to 1. Well, it's obviously impossible. Well, I can't say impossible. And nothing's impossible. But it would be extremely unlikely and probably very expensive to shoot at that kind of uh, codec, at that kind of resolution, at a shooting ratio of 700 to 1. What if you shoot in this new codec XABC? So that's a Sony codec that was introduced earlier this year with the advent of the F5 and the F55. Okay, so now you're, you're back to applying compression to make file sizes a little bit more manageable. It's still pretty big. 154 gigs an hour is an XABC 4K file. So to put that in perspective, DNX 175X is about 90, 91, 92 gigs an hour. And that's the way we've been finishing high quality, high end scripted television shows for years. So that's already about, that's almost double what we're actually, what you're seeing on television if you're watching Breaking Bad, for example. Even XABC HD is still pretty big, that's 51 gigs an hour, roughly comparable to DMX 145, which is in that same target, about 60 gigs an hour. And by contrast, the client in this building that shot 4,300 hours of footage for a show that produced eight finished hours of content, that was Canon XF, that's roughly 24 gigs an hour. So if you get into the world of 4K, even when you fly a codec, just caveat enter, just know what you're getting into, it is gigantic, or it can be gigantic. And of course, with every decision along these lines, there is a ramification when it comes to cost, processing time, conform time, and so on. All the obvious things that, not are, not, that are not always so obvious when shows are getting off the ground. Any questions so far? Everybody's favorite. Definitely my favorite. <coughs> so anyone who knows me well has heard me talk about frame rate, mixed frame rate issues for about a decade to the point where I think every colleague and coworker I have is so sick to death of hearing me talk about mixed frame rate workflows, they really just want to shoot me in the face. However, it still seems to be one of those things that creates a lot of confusion for a lot of shows. One of the things that we've noticed is that because camera systems are more affordable and allow 24-piece photography, broadcast television is still a 30 frame rate medium. So now what do you do? The question I get the most often is, well, can I shoot in 24 and cut in 30? What if I have to deliver in 30? What if I have to deliver 30 and 24 both? All of a sudden, Amazon and iTunes want 24 frame deliverables, even if you shoot at 30. Now what do you do? How do you balance 24 and 30 or 30 to 24 in this kind of crazy mixed frame rate world? Well, one of the things that's taken me by surprise with some of our reality TV clients is that some of the folks that we've worked with actually don't seem to realize that the Media Composer software actually in many respects has solved this problem. The timeline is essentially an open canvas now. You can litter the timeline with any frame rate you want, even PAL. So 24, 30, 25, 60, pretty much any frame rate can coexist in the same timeline. I am brought into many editing rooms <coughs> frequently. Ask the question, we're, we're delivering 30, how do we convert our 24 frame material to work in 30? Or vice versa. We have to deliver 24, how do we convert or pre-convert our stuff that was shot in 30. The idea being, or the supposition being that this has to be converted before it's used. Well, the good news is that you don't have to do that. So I wanted to kind of hammer home that point. But that seems to be a source of confusion for a lot of folks. Any frame rate can be mixed in the editing timeline. 
However, that doesn't mean that there isn't a good strategy that you can apply in terms of whether you should be cutting in 24 or cutting in 30, depending on how you deliver. I always tell everyone the rule of thumb is ingest natively. If you shot 24, capture 24. There really is no reason to do frame rate conversions at the ingest stage. What if you shot 4,300 hours of footage? If you had to, if you had to, if the software precluded this mixing of frame rates in the same timeline, and if this were pre media Composer version 4, for those of you who remember that, then you would have to do frame rate conversions in advance. There is no reason to do that anymore. So if you um, shoot 24, create a 24 frame project, and ingest those 24. By ingest, I mean you're either consolidating or transcoding, probably transcoding and standard. Once you've ingested natively, you can take that bin with the media that you created and bring it into any project type you want. So if the majority of your material is 30, and you have the outlier, if you have some 24p material, create a 24p project, <coughs> consolidate or transcode, close out of the project, go into the 30-frame project, and now you can drop those clips onto your 30-frame timeline all you want. And the reverse is also true. If you've seen those little green dots in your timeline, those are called motion adapters. And that basically is a real-time motion effect that is doing essentially a live inter interpolation of that frame rate in the <coughs> timeline of a disparate frame rate. So the good news is you can really go to town. You can really intermix any frame rate that you want. Um, another misconception that I bump, bump into all the time with reality TV productions is that when it comes to doing the conform, you have to leave the box to do those conversions. You have to exit the added environment to convert 24 to 30 or 30 to 24. Under some circumstances, that might be true. For the most part, you don't necessarily have to leave the software. You can do all this in software. So if you are delivering 30, and you're working predominantly with 24p material, uh, Media Composer will apply 2-3 pull-down. You know, it introduces those additional fields and frames that will get you to 30, and that's a non-destructive process. You're not stepping on frames by doing so. <coughs> The reverse from 30 to 24 is, by nature, it is a destructive process. You are leaving frames on the ground. So how well that looks and how good that looks after the, after the fact depends on the material. Typically, we find that talking heads in 30 converted to 24 actually need to go to a pretty good job. So even though the temptation may be that some other tool is necessary to do, to do conversions. By the way, if you, want to, if you want to leave the island environment and do frame rate conversions in other software, you're welcome to do it. I'm just saying it's not necessarily required, and it's certainly more efficient to stay in the software. If you do a frame rate conversion in software, the metadata stays the same, the clip naming conventions stay the same, the tape name is still there, the time code is still there, even though the time code may be different because of the frame rate change, and so on. If you leave the software and you're doing conversions, effectively you're flattening your file, and you're, the, the, the likelihood is that you're losing metadata. Uh, real ideas going away, the, t the time code may change, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So I normally try to encourage people do conversions in the software. The only time that you may want to use some outboard tool, either uh, a, a more expensive hardware system like a Terranex or an Alchemist, or another software tool like a Flowmaster or a Phoenix, uh, is if you have extremely complex material in 30 and you have to go backwards to 24. Under those circumstances, circumstances, yes, you may need another tool to get the best possible image out of, say, sports material or something that has an enormous amount of motion or color information in the image. Um, a common question with mixed frame rate workflows is if I'm cutting in 24, how do I cut the clock? That time code window in a 24 frame project, by the way, when I say 24, I'm using that synonymously with 2398. You can track 2398, 30 non drop, and 30 drop frame at the same time. Your editor, in my opinion, should have that time code window up all the time if you are trying to figure out what your eventual runtime will be in 30 drop frame if you're cutting in 2398. So, the question I get all the time is, alright, we're cutting in 2398, how do I know what the runtime of the show will be in 30 drop frame? Just open up that time code window and map two rows above your composer window, and you'll be able to tell what the 30 non-drop runtime will be, which is the same as 24, and what the 30 drop frame runtime will be. So, again, it's these little things that when you tell people this, the giant light bulb goes off in the head. I didn't realize it was that easy. I'm not saying it's easy, but it is easier to use. Media Composer is really the best time code calculator you're gonna get. And in many respects, it's rare to leave the box just because the tool set is, is there. This is another one. This is something that, this is kind of a, something I should talk to the ad guys about. This is probably one of the most important things you can do in a mixed frame rate workflow that is very often overlooked is defining what is the scan of the file um, at the initial point of ingest. 
So if you're doing frame rate conversions, the software doesn't magically know if material is progressive or interlaced or if it has 2, 3 pull, pull down. If it's 2398, by definition, it's progressive. If it's 2997P, it might be progressive, it might be interlaced, or it might actually have 2, 3 built in. The software doesn't magically know. You, on a human level, have to tell the software. You will get poorer results in terms of 30 to 24 conversions unless you do that. I guarantee there are people in this room who have done this. So if the software doesn't know what the frame-by-frame -frame scan is of the material, it's going to guess. And usually you're going to get artifacting and motion artifacts and that kind of thing. And the results are not very positive. And sometimes that leads people to believe that media composer is not the right tool to do some of those conversions, even though the material has two, three pull-down baked in. And extracting the pull-down is as simple as defining it in the, in the field motion column. Um, one of my future requests to Avid is that when you connect to a file through AMA, that if, let's say you turn on a setting, it will force you to, to define what its scan is at the time you connect to it. That feature has not been implemented. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see what we can do. We'll see what we can do, exactly. <laughs> However, one thing that is new in 7.0 that I love uh, is the fact that you can now change, um, you can change the field motion column in a little bit. Earlier versions, you have to do a clip by clip which shows uh, some people have something else. Now you can do it globally, which is good. So if you're not familiar with this column, you should get familiar with this column if you're working in mixed frame rate work, mixed frame rate workflow. It is essential, especially if you anticipate that you'll be going from one frame rate to another at any point in your process. Let's go back to this, 701, not an exaggeration. What do you do with all that data? Where is it going to live? The history of 4,300 hours of footage. Put it on hard drive. So pretty much 100% of you have seen shells and shells and shells and shells of hard drives. Hard drives, for the most part, with some exceptions, were not necessarily designed for longevity. They were designed to be cheap. In some cases, they were desi designed to have good performance, but not longevity. Despite that, they're very inexpensive. So that's why we have shells and shells and shells with the C rugged drives or if you spend a little bit more, you have the G-Tech drives, or you have the Glyph drives, or you know, whatever the drive du jour is. The problem is that, A, it's a, it's, a, it's a device with moving parts inside. It tends to be physically small. It is probably going to get bounced around. It'll probably be in somebody's handbag at some point. The device is going to fail. So the last couple of years, reality TV shows have started to learn about LTO workflows. So I'm going inside, and you know what this is. This is an LTO tape drive. That's an LTO 5 tape drive. The question is, who does that work? That's one of the biggest conundrums with reality TV shows, as we've noticed as an observer of those projects. Is it the production company's job to archive that LTO 5 tape? Is it the network's job? Or is it the production company's job? Who owns the material? Who has the, the burden of doing that? It's a ton of work. LTO 5 or LTO 4, LTO 5 tape <laughs> systems are getting faster, but intrinsically, they're not the fast. They're not as fast as spinning disk. So it does take a long time to put that onto tape. Not to mention, not every there isn't one unified spec for LTO. Is it TAR? Is it LTFS? Is it the variation of either TAR or LTFS? Is it a uh, LTO spec that you are coming up with yourself, or is the network imposing on you? I don't mean that negatively. Is the network telling you how to do it? I'm actually curious, what, what is everybody's experience? Are you deciding for yourself that you should just put this on the tape because it's the right thing to do? Or is a network that you are collaborating with or bringing your product to, giving you a spec, literally a piece of paper saying, this is how you should be archiving the tape? Yes. Both? Yes. <laughs> That's been our experience too. And there isn't one spec, and it does change frequently. We have found that most of the reality TV shows that we're working with in this building um, are actually just buying their own tape drives. They're not overwhelmingly expensive. You can probably buy a good system for under $10,000. Uh, but even for $2,500, you can buy uh, a single stack LTO5 tape drive. And the physicality of creating those archives is pretty easy. It's like burning a DVD. So if you haven't thought about it, you should think about it. If you're not doing it, you probably should do it. The big question is, well, how do you retrieve data from LTO tapes in some kind of organized fashion? And that gets much more fun. Any questions about LTO or horror stories or I'm sure there's horror stories. So what does the future look like? 
made up myself. <laughs> well, then I'll leave that. Um, well, one of the most interesting things about Postgres and being here is that we do spend a tremendous amount of time trying to think about this. Think about the, the, the physical plant that is Postgres. We are 120 editors, miles and miles of fiber optic cable, fleet of hundreds of atoms. Yet, for years, we've been talking about how long will that paradigm last? How long will people be bringing their entire team into a place like this? Ostensibly, this is the place to be. Everything is under one roof. We have dailies. We have editorials. We have online. We have color. We have finishing. We have mix. We have everything under one roof. It's almost like the studio system in the 1930s. Literally everything is here. Yet at the same time, networks are paying less for content. Everything is going down in price. Um, it is more difficult to make budgets work. So what does that mean? Will there be a natural, for lack of a better way of putting it, natural entropy? the process where a team of 20 people may not necessarily be in one place at one time all the time. Bits and pieces of the process or certain aspects of the division of labor may float away. Well, to some degree, that's what Bob was talking about at the beginning of this presentation, where networks and the distribution of data are rephrased. Not so much the distribution of data, this, the further centralization of data, <coughs> but the accessibility of data in a very, very different way will be more relevant. We actually started talking about this at Postgres five years ago. Technology wasn't quite there, or it was just too expensive. I think one of the things that Ian's going to be talking about is, well, what if one day a reality TV show wants to do exactly that? The transcribers, the loggers, some of the smaller tasks, not smaller tasks, I'll rephrase, I'll rephrase, some of the more um, uh, computationally intense tasks, perhaps, may not necessarily have to be in a facility. They could be across the street, they could be in Williamsburg, they could be in another state. But the, the ongoing goal of collaboration goes away if you have to make replicate copies of data. If you're making more copies of data, what's the point? It's a way to do it, but it's not necessarily the most elegant way to do it. So how can a facility continue to be the bit bucket, the bank? Just like a bank, you withdraw from the bank and there's a transaction, a transaction that you can bring so, it's very much the same concept. So this is something that we've been thinking a ton about. Will it go in that direction? Not really sure. We're definitely preparing for that. And we definitely think there's going to be some of this. How much, to what degree, how will tell. What about distributed ingest? Another concept that we've been talking about at for a long time. The idea that rather than stacking more and more habits, ingest 4,200 hours of footage, is there a smarter way? Well, good news is version 7 means Blizzard does introduce background processes so that you can do some of the stuff in the background while you get your UI back. Definitely a step in the right and best direction. But can that be taken to an even more dramatic extreme? Can something like an ISIS volume, for example, uh, distribute the rendering over multiple nodes? This is not a conversation I've necessarily had with that, but this is me kind of with my own wish list. Um, or will it be up to facilities like Postgres to come, with our, come up with our own methodology to assist with dumping, to being the giant shovel? Of what I like to call it, shoveling tons and tons of data into the editorial uh, process. Uh, and of course, one of the most ambiguous areas of reality TV production or unscripted anything is the concept of the asset management system. Probably the most vague, ambiguous thing you can talk about. There are asset management systems out there that are astonishingly expensive. There are some that are much more affordable. They all, as I like to say, they all suck at something, and they're all really good at something. The ones that are more hooked into the other environment are probably the ones that are more desirable. Interplay is certainly the most interesting one out there for the obvious reason that it's coming from the same company that's running the editing software. And as of April, uh, the price has come down enormously, and they've introduced functionality in Interplay that is much more geared towards reality TV productions. 24P is supported, Mac is supported, Multicam is supported. Things that really weren't there for us when we started asking about Interplay for reality TV productions five years ago and four years ago. I'm sure that's something that Ian's going to be talking more about. <coughs> this isn't really here for any particular reason other than the fact that I love it. <laughs> um, this was written by an executive from Fox uh, at the start of Life of Pi. And he sat down with our chief technology officer, Joe Byrne, and they sketched out what that workflow was going to be. And I just absolutely enjoyed this. I mean, this literally on a cocktail napkin. 
Uh, and uh, so Joe made a scan of it. And, you know, this is a lot of what we talk about at Postworks. And there's no reason why this is actually any different than the workflows that are necessary for, for unscripted. If anything, I might argue that some of the workflows that you guys do in the realm of unscripted production is more challenging than we get in scripted television and feature films. The shooting ratio is so off the charts, nobody else has that kind of masochistic need to shoot that much and deal with it on that level. It's crazy. You're all crazy. However, it does present some really, really fascinating workflow challenges. And, and a lot of those discussions produce diagrams like this. That's all I have for today. Thank you so much for coming. talking about, specifically with uh, what we've been doing at Avid, uh, really do embrace and, and fine tune some of the, the tools that we have for reality television, and um, talk through that with you guys tonight. Uh, thanks for making it out. Uh, certainly, um, thanks to Bob and the VCA guys. Uh, I, I was an offline and online guy for many years, and so I always appreciated resellers for putting a bunch of people in a room. Uh, I think it's good for community, and I think it's good for exchanging knowledge. This is our industry, and it's, it's often kind of hard to find that one uh, bit of information, maybe from Matt or for some other people, that kind of just changes the whole way that, that you work and manage your project, so it's really important. And then also, uh, I think for, for PostWorks in general, uh, I think the relationship that we've had with Matt and Joe and, and some of the folks at PostWorks have been good. In fact, there's a lot of PostWorks in Media Composer 7. Uh, the teams uh, typically come down to, to the shop and exchange ideas, and a lot of the, the work around the color management in Media Composer 7 comes directly, I think, from conversations that we have with uh, uh, folks uh, as invested in, in uh, finding better tools as, as post-work is. Um, so just to go through that a little bit, um, I think it was maybe uh, about a year ago, Matt called me up and he said, hey, you know, we've got this production that's uh, shooting out of state, uh, post services, editorial services are going to be here in New York. Is there a better way to kind of build a bridge between production and post? And I kind of smiled a little bit because uh, uh, Matt said something along the lines of, hey, you know, I saw this thing at uh, uh, IBC. It's called Sphere. It connects Media Composer remotely, and we stream media to it. Is that something that we can use for to kind of solve this problem? First of all, it's cool, I think, for, for Matt to kind of do a bunch of homework in advocacy for uh, the clients. Um, and at the same time, I was smiling a little bit, knowing what he was getting after and that we were working on it. And um, it's some of that stuff I'd like to relate tonight. So anyway, I wanted to start off with uh, reality TV and why it matters. Um, so for me, even in my career as an offline guy, online guy, I worked on quite a bit of uh, reality television. So uh, this stuff uh, resonates with me. And I wanted to just kind of point out that if you look here in the blue, you'll notice that over the last decade, these are Nielsen ratings. For prime time share of the, the audience, uh, reality television has been doing pretty darn well. And this doesn't show the whole story. This is the writer's strike, by the way. <laughs> the, uh, the thing that's really important is that reality television matters within a strategy of networks because, first of all, it, it uh, does very well with certain demographics that are of ad value. Um, there's a lot of people that socialize about reality television, so there's almost this halo effect of uh, audience sort of engagement with reality television. There are a lot of cool things about reality television. But as if Matt, I think, has pretty clearly gone through, and as we've talked before, there's almost a price of the ticket to be able to furnish some of that content. And I think Matt went through a lot of the problems very, very well. Um, first of all, the thing that defines reality television is an enormous shooting ratio. Um, you know, we averages range between 101 to 401, and in extreme cases, 701, and even maybe beyond that. Those are pretty high watermarks, but not, not surprising. Um, I think also, you know, where does that shooting ratio come from? Multicam productions really are a defining factor because they, there's a diversity of different formats uh, that uh, are used to kind of capture all this stuff. Um, uh, GoPros, for example, DSLRs, you know, having those smaller packages allow more intimacy with, those, with, the, with the characters. And at the end of the day, stories and characters are what anchors audiences. So if we're not telling good stories with reality television, we're not developing characters, the likelihood of that show making it past season one or past the pilot is pretty low. People grab on, they'll maybe check out a show for a concept, but they'll continue to watch because there's good storytelling and certainly uh, memorable characters. Or, and they don't even have to be likable characters, they just have to be memorable, right? So a big part of that is, <clears throat> I think, uh, 
being kind of a champion or um, getting past this high shooting ratio and, and finding the actual clips that are going to tell your story. Uh, you guys know that probably more than, um, than most. Um, we also noticed that when shows are successful, multiple seasons with large casts, the, uh, the amount of footage that accrues, and depending on the format of the show, if you have a format of the show that uh, has flashbacks, for example, you're revisiting story development or character development in season one, and now you're successful in season three, <coughs> you need to go back to that material. Uh, being able to find what you're looking for quickly can be, can be tough. In early seasons, you might not have the, the budget necessarily to have paid for uh, uh, folks on the set to do good tape logs for you. It might be tough to find some of that material. So that's a challenge, certainly, for reality television. It's a big part of, uh, again, kind of the price of the ticket for generating uh, this kind of content. Um, uh, one thing I mentioned right off the top is production typically is not shot in the same area where post services are. And I think that's also a fundamental problem or challenge with reality television, and probably scripted as well. I mean, people don't tend to edit where they shoot. Um, and to Matt's sort of summation, is there a better way? And I think the answer is yes, and hopefully we share some of that with you tonight. And then again, I think across the board, in our entire industry, whether it be scripted or sports or news or whatever, um, there's certainly a downward pressure on budgets today. And the only way to kind of fight through that, I think, even though the networks really do uh, like to fund and uh, green light reality production is you have to be uh, really, really efficient to, to make it work for them. <clears throat> so uh, tonight, I really kind of what I wanted to do is uh, walk through the, some of the changes that we have in Media Composer 7.0 um, and also Interplay Production 3.0. To Matt's point, both of these uh, products for us or these builds for us were furnished just this year. I mean, it was NAB that we announced and we shipped. Uh, both, I think, in the month of June. So this is all pretty, pretty new stuff. I know that some of you, I talked to some of you beforehand, and you've had an opportunity to uh, take a look at seven. Maybe I can share a little bit more. Okay, I'll just uh, grab some water real quick. I'll talk about some media composer seven. So I think it was Adam that I was talking to before. So media composer seven is pretty cool for a lot of reasons. Most of which, I think, really uh, are for the assistants in the house is that there's a lot of stuff under the covers that really makes this multiplicity of formats and um, uh, the ingest of file-based media much, much easier. Uh, the other thing that's important about this release, too, is that we notice that a lot of people are acquiring higher and higher resolutions. Matt mentioned that there's some productions now bubbling into 4K workflows, and how do you handle that when you shoot log C and these sorts of things. Um, the, when the Media Composer team went out and took requirements from the market, they noticed that a lot of people were shooting those higher resolutions, but they weren't necessarily mastering or delivering them. They were delivering typically in HD. So in this release, the Media Composer team took a really big strike toward um, what they eventually want to do, which is resolution independence. And they want to be able to do it and do it right and not break a lot of backward compatibility. Um, this release, I think, is significant because it, it gets, it's a huge step in the right direction. So I just wanted to briefly break down, again, I know that some of you have already seen Media Composer 7 and had a chance to digest some of what's there. For me tonight, I think the, the three topics, these are the major themes of the release. I really want to talk about background processing, I want to talk about dynamic media folders, and specifically Interplay Sphere, and what that's all about. Um, actually, I'll just go back a step. Um, it's not that I don't care to talk about these things, because these directly relate, in some cases, to Matt's question about um, the improved color uh, conversion tools, frame flex for region of interest within the higher than HD resolution, codecs and formats, a lot of AMA improvements in the Composer 7, uh, a lot of audio tools, like uh, caching of, of waveforms, so if you're familiar with, I'm sure if you guys have spent any time on, on a Media Composer and wait to see the waveform build every single time you zoom. That's no longer, they build once and they can zoom in and out and it's, and it's fine. There's a lot of really cool stuff under the covers in the Composer 7. But again, for me, uh, and given the amount of time that we have tonight, I'm going to talk about background process, dynamic new folders, and interplay sphere. So the, the first thing that's worth pointing out is that there's a, this really cool feature in Media Composer 7 called dynamic media folders. We call them DMFs, uh, which is, if Abbott likes anything, we like acronyms, but importantly, <laughs> sorry about that. Um, this is, as you can see from the slide, this concept of a, of, of a watch folder. This isn't unfamiliar to some of us if we've used other compression software or we've used the things in the past. 
you can tag a folder um, as uh, and associate a profile with, with that profile. As you put media into it, the profile will process that media based on the, the, the details that you put in it. And what's important about this is it's happening in the background. I think Matt mentioned this briefly, which is you still have your foreground capabilities to use uh, media composer in the foreground. Meanwhile, you've got footage basically ingesting in the background. And um, this is pretty pretty great. I, the, this is a product of a, a couple different developments around media composer 7, one of which is 64-bit forwarding. Uh, which allowed for some of the, the headroom for these sorts of, uh, and the beginning of some of the processes to be pushed in the background. Um, that's, uh, I think, uh, one of the ways we got there. And the other way is related to the, the other topic that I'm going to talk about is Interplay Sphere, um, which was the first time that there was a background process in, in Media Composer. And that for folks who hadn't seen it and understood how it worked, um, that was kind of a, the earliest hint that there was going to be more and more background process within the composer. So pretty cool. So uh, some of the ways that it works is that you so, uh, build this profile and then process your media against it. You have sort of notifications. Uh, the guys did a really great job. Uh, if you set up a, a bunch of footage coming in, you didn't want to disrupt the editorial process. You editors typically want to edit, and they want to be have, having things jumping in, in their face. So there's a notification system where when footage is processed and ready, it sort of notifies the editor in a very light way, and then they say yes, accept, and then the footage comes in. So it doesn't really get away. Uh, we have automatic checking into Interplay uh, by DNS, which is pretty important and pretty cool. And um, uh, the other thing about DMF is it can run even if Media Composer is not running. You do need a license for Media Composer, but if you don't, if you need to shut down Media Composer, the process continues to run in the background. So all pretty cool. So Interplay Sphere. Talk about this. Uh, the concept behind this is that you have Media Composer, you have it loaded on a laptop, and you need to be in the field. Uh, it was originally sort of conceived around news workflows where there are a lot of folks who didn't want to use satellite trucks because they're expensive to maintain. And, and certainly in an age where we have 4G and Wi Fi and LAN and, and WAN, can't we use commodity tools to sort of uh, put data back and forth? And the answer for us at Avid was yes. And this is kind of a big story where, and is a huge signifier of where Avid is going in, in general. Uh, the way that it works is that you can have a laptop loaded with Media Composer. You go out into the field, you shoot with your Canon 5D, for example, and you can um, upload that footage back to the facility, back to the ISIS or Avid shared storage. Um, the other thing you can do is play footage from that facility, from that ISIS that you didn't bring with you, and play it to your, to your laptop. And you can combine both local and remote clips on the same timeline. You can tag sequences for remote upload, and it's all pretty cool. Um, so, for example, tonight uh, we're going to be playing footage from Boston and uploading footage to Boston. And um, the import of this, we'll, we'll talk about in a bit, but um, again, this sort of preceded DMS, but one of the things that's really important to point out is that local clips are uploaded in the background while the editor continues to edit. This was a big part, and again, the first signifier that was going to be background uh, processing and media composer is that as you're working and as you're cutting, the clips that you're uploading, or the sequences that you've tagged for upload, so as you add clips, local clips to that sequence, they upload in the background. So this was uh, the first time we've done that. This works on uh, proxy or full res media, and it's transmitted, transmitted by Wi-Fi 4D and WAN. And um, let me see, I think we're actually going to go into the UI. Uh, to Matt's point, when Matt called me up and said, hey, we've got this production, uh, one of the things that we didn't have at that time that we do have, as of June, is 1080p 23.976 support. We also have Mac OS support. This is a picture of the installer. Um, these are all the services that are loaded onto Media Composer to make it participate as a, uh, sort of a client of uh, an interplay work group. And as of um, this, uh, this release this year, those are all the project formats supported within, within Sphere. I'll just kind of point out uh, a question about interplay in the past. Uh, Interplay, for those of you who don't know, Interplay is an asset management system that Avid created and brought to market in 2006, uh, back in that era. Um, news, uh, news environments were really, really trying to make this transition from uh, SD to HD. They had large media libraries. They were trying to um, generate news stories 24 by 7, and really just pounding, pounding a bunch of different media. Fast forward to 2013, we start to see a lot of post workflows running into the same sort of uh, uh, problems, is that we're all kind of swimming in, in file-based media and need to find footage quickly. 
So in, um, this is basically MIDI Composer hooked up to Interplay. You'll notice that there's an Interplay window here in the, the lower left-hand corner. And this is uh, pretty much a picture of uh, Interplay Sphere. So it's MIDI Composer connected to a work group, connected directly to ISIS storage, playing back media from that storage, and uploading media to it. And it's all facilitated by our asset management system Interplay. So Corey, I think that the first thing maybe to point out is the Interplay window. And that the Interplay window is uh, sort of uh, like a, a folder navigation system and a search engine all in one, sort of in one window that can kind of minimize within the composer or um, it can um, sort of just be placed just like a band or something like that anywhere in the interface. So the idea is that you have a search engine dedicated to all your asset uh, library. And so what happens here is that Corey can pull up some footage from one of the projects. Once she finds the clips uh, that she's looking for, she can uh, either drag them into a bin or preview them from the interplay window. Uh, the idea in this case is like, hey, you know, it's Corey and I in, in New York and we want to cut some footage that we have in Boston along with footage that we shot here tonight at Postbook, for example, I don't know. And so what uh, Corey will do is just kind of load a couple clips into the bin. You'll notice that the iconography for those clips have a little downward arrow which lets the user know that these are clips that are uh, playing from afar, um, that they're uh, remote clips as opposed to local clips. And what you'll do is just uh, load a couple of those up into the, the uh, either the sequence or the, uh, the source uh, monitor and just start playing with them. Uh, they play uh, almost immediately on a, on a good connection. It's important to point out that um, Interplay Sphere really only requires 3 point meg down, which is pretty modest in that connectivity. We recommend 5 meg down. And the more bandwidth you have, obviously the better performance that you're going to get. And so with that, you know, Corey's playing footage from Boston and dropping it in a timeline, and maybe combining it with some local AMA clips, and um, can open up the um, upload yes, dialogue. So right here I have, uh, in the local media, I have some AMA clips. If you're not familiar with our new little AMA right. icon, that's what that is there. There's a little chain yeah. there. So this is Panasonic stuff that I have locally, an elephant. So it's perfectly with this Nike ad. <laughs> um, yeah, thanks for pointing that out, Corey, because I think sometimes I sort of forget some of the iconography changes in the newer releases. So if you're currently working on builds that are 6.0 or, or earlier, you're probably not familiar with some of the, the bin layout and some of those changes. So thanks for pointing that out, Corey. Yeah, so this is, you can see the, um, I'll zoom in a little so you can actually take a look at it. So all of this stuff that I'm pulling down is proxy. So I'm looking at the proxy media, the local stuff there, obviously it's, uh, <coughs> not a proxy. So the idea being, is, as Ian was saying, is that I'm working remotely, all this stuff is on, all the stuff in yellow is proxy, that's, that's on an ISIS that's in uh, Massachusetts, and I'm able to play with it here remotely. And then I have uh, some local media here that I'm editing with. So uh, the upload dialog that Ian is talking about is basically, um, you talk about doing an upload, but what I'm really doing, which is Ian's point is I'm, I'm syncing the sequence. So I'm going to initiate this, and it's basically setting the sequence up to be a synced sequence. So what that means is that once I do that, I set this up, um, I don't have to think about it anymore. As I continue to edit, any local media that I'm cutting into my timeline is automatically going to be sent based on these preferences back to the ISIS so that the folks that are back in Boston are going to be able to, they already have the metadata, we're on it, not easy. They just have to pull that out of the window. But then they're going to be getting, um, whether it's proxy or high res, depending on the my set, of the clips plus any handles. It works the same way as consolidating or transcoding. You get to set that up. And you can transcode here. You'll see they're saying the source versus uh, transcode. Yeah, can you pull that dialog down just to maybe show some of the transcode options? Sure. So you can transcode and upload in the background at the same time. And to uh, Corey's point, I think what's what's pretty cool about this is you we give you full control over the upload settings uh, to transcode, and depending on the bandwidth that you happen to have in the field, um, you can uh, send less up, or you can set it to be kind of staggered. You know, uh, first you can set up proxy, uh, then you can set up higher, and then you can do proxy then high. This is maybe uh, important for news workflows where they want to break the story as fast as possible uh, at one o'clock, but then for the five o'clock news, they want the best looking image. They've got the interim time, but between when they broke the story and when not. Um, it's important uh, also to point out that while uh, Corey's playing back some proxy right now, that again, mix and match, uh, different formats at the same timeline, the playback service that we use 
to enable this uh, playback to the MIDI closer on a laptop in the field will play pretty much anything. So you could play back in a DNX 220. Uh, the stream count that you'll get by playing back footage is, uh, uh, you know, it's a sort of question of math at that point, depending on how you scale the environment. I'll show you a, a schematic of how it works. But if you have 220 and 145 and you want to see it in the field, you don't have to transcode it, you can just play it. And it's just a question of whether or not you built your uh, uh, your service such that you know a lot of people can be playing DNX 220 at the same time. It's just a question of scale. Anything that a media composer could do that's directly connected, you can do remotely. It's all a matter of your bandwidth. It's going to pull down the um, uh, proxies, and if it can play real time, it will, the same way it would um, on a regular right. Thanks, Gordon. Maybe we'll come back to that for maybe q and So we'll just talk quickly about how that works. So again, um, it's always fun to show Sphere because uh, I demoed once in LA at the Editor's Lounge. And, um, Playing back footage from Boston, it's, it's pretty cool. And the reason why we showed is we think that this can be uh, really beneficial to all workflows and reality television workflows among them. Because as you can share access to your footage, so let's say at PostWorks or something like that, you have this hub of media, this this, this library, um, it can be shared out to a lot of different uh, folks. So depending on the talent that you need, you may need translation, you may need transcription, you may need logging, you may need uh, you want to work with uh, your favorite editor who previously worked on the show but is now moved to a different area. You can still work with he or she. Um, you know, it starts to become really interesting about how remote access uh, can be really powerful. Um, it's also possible that if you were interviewing one of your um, uh, your characters and you wanted to flash back or interview them about a moment in time where there was a fight or um, some travel episode. There's nothing that would stop the production crew from flipping open the, uh, the, the media composer and playing back footage of that particular scene, show the talent, hey, this is the moment that we're, we're interviewing you about today to kind of put them in that mindset. So access has a lot of benefits that aren't um, always apparent. You know, it's pretty interesting how it can take place. So just to point out how Interplay Sphere works is that um, these are uh, schematics of what Interplay winds up uh, uh, looking like. So uh, in basic terms, we build up from Avid Storage, so you've got your ISIS storage on the bottom. And on the left, we see kind of the big version. So when um, customers, uh, networks, news organizations um, build out an interplay environment, it can scale up to 330 workstations and multiple work groups, uh, 19, 24 work groups to span across the world. We have a lot of big environments. What we've done in Interplay Production 3.0 is scale a lot of that down. So some of the the bottles that Matt referred to and some of the value that we've kind of pushed into these smaller packages is really a, looks like a pair where we've uh, got small work groups that can, can work. The, uh, this is basically, these are servers. Each one of these move blocks is a server. And so in big environments, we build essentially a framework media indexer and database. This is kind of just uh, some terms that we use to describe um, how your asset library is tracked and indexed. So if you, have, if you can imagine a library um, and you have a librarian running around and sort of keeping count of all the books. This is what Interplay does. And more than that, it sort of connects that media library to a set of services for transcode, archive, restore, anything you want to do to push, uh, push your asset library to an archive system or uh, to Nearline or manage different storage tiers, you can do that because of this. The other thing um, is that as you look out to the, uh, the orange box, this is another server. For us, this is a HP DL360 G8 server, and that is essentially the, uh, uh, the Sphere server, or central server. It's a piece of gear that transcodes, or I should say, that generates a stream sort of on the fly of that DNX220 or the, uh, the proxy that you have to send out to the laptop. Um, and it's just commodity server hardware that we use, and um, that workflow is enabled by um, essentially the interplay uh, in between and the storage. Uh, the one thing I want to point out is that Interplay Sphere is really just one part of the family. Um, as you see on the left-hand side, um, you have MIDI Composer at the top, and I'm calling that a heavy client. It's kind of an IT term for um, a, you know, a piece of software that installs with drivers, GPU, acceleration, just a traditional client as we've always known it. And as we go down to the middle of the diagram, you'll notice a mobile client, and you'll notice a web client. All three of these, are one family. Um, 
And basically what Adam's future is all about and what we've been working really hard to establish is um, this idea of remote workflow architecture. Uh, we call it Interplay Central. Um, and, and that's the architecture. Interplay Central also happens to be a native mobile application as well as a web client, and we'll be showing you that as well. But in all three cases, the playback service that we're using is, is pretty much the same. Uh, a lot of people ask me, hey, you know, Abbott acquired a company called Maximum Throughput a couple years ago. Whatever happened to that, that technology? Well, this is, this is it. This is Maximum Throughput. Throughput technology with a lot of work put on top of it to make it furnish basically tools that people want to use. So typically when we talk about mobile clients, we've thought about these devices, iPads and I, uh, iPhones, as consumption devices. This is what we get our news on. This is how we check our email. These are, in some cases, how we watch content. What we wanted to do at Avid is kind of flip the switch a little bit and stuff to make them productivity tools so that people can contribute to creative processing and be involved or stay in touch with the latest cut. I want to watch the latest uh, version of my iPad of uh, the cut that the, the editor picked out today for, for uh, a final. I want to see the lock cut. Um, or be able to contribute um, in other ways. So another one that we'll talk about is this web client. So instead of having to have a dongle or a license of Media Composer and install and make sure you have the latest drivers, wouldn't it be cool if you just had, I don't know, Safari or Chrome and just typed in a URL and then you connect it to your media. So that's essentially what we've had uh, with Interplay Central, which we've had for a couple of years now. So again, just kind of to break the two things apart a little bit, Interplay Sphere is this playback service being connected to Media Composer. And you know, it's a two-way street. You have both playback and upload capabilities. Uh, you have a dedicated uh, editorial tool set. I mean, Media Composer been around for years, so it's a very easy tool set. And uh, yeah, it's a pure uh, remote playback and upload. On the right-hand side, Interplay Central, again, we haven't done ourselves any favor, I think, with the way that we've named Interplay Central. It's both an architecture that facilitates the playback, but we've also decided uh, that it would be uh, a UI as well. So on the right-hand side here, you'll notice that we've got the web-based client, the mobile client. And really what we've tried to do with these tools is create a tool set that was appropriate for staff that aren't necessarily editors. Uh, uh, I think when you look at the credits of anyone's show, uh, be it in scripted or, or reality or documentary, there are a lot of folks that work on a show before it gets out to network and to air. We wanted to create a tool set that was flexible enough to work with people who are writers by trade, who are producers, who are clients, who are the web team, the promo department, um, you know, you name it, all those names that you see in the credits, this is where we think Interplay Central can be. Um, there are a lot of folks that are intimidated by the media composer. It's a very deep tool and it's dedicated stuff. Um, some people just want to drop markers and I want to play back a cut. They don't really need media composer. They can do something else. Um, so we'll, we'll show you a little bit about that. This is Interplay Central. Uh, like I said, it's a, it's a web-based client. Um, it allows folks to organize, navigate, search. You can edit a rough cut. It's simplified, sort of lightweight editorial tools. So you can put some stuff together. You can do a rough mix, although there's some um, really nice automatic mixing tools already in Central, so you don't have to mix perfectly. There's preset uh, sort of uh, game levels for the, those tracks. You can play in the view. Um, you can customize the layout. Uh, in this case, again, the whole point of Interplay Central as a web-based client is to let people build the tool that they want to be able to use. That way, we can extend it out to a lot of different persona. You can mark and log, and you can message. We'll talk about some of these things. These are some of the, uh, again, the kinds of staff, sorry about the, uh, <laughs> the dangling R there. Uh, these are some of the folks that could be using this tool that aren't necessarily folks who mix or folks who need to edit, but need to be able to contribute to create a creative process. So producers, big primary example, loggers, directors, media manager, you know, you've got transcription services. Um, sometimes with reality television, we talked with Matt and Haley the other day about <coughs> promos can be really disruptive. You have to stop down and up res in order to get uh, promo material to the uh, to the network. It can be it can be tough to manage that and not stop down the editors from coming at the same time. So this is Interplay Central, and one of the things that we did in this most recent release is we put multicam capabilities into the tool. So for reality television, which is inherently uh, multicam centric, we have tools now for folks who need to be able to see that footage from anywhere. You know, if you have producers who are at the shop, they go out to the field, they come back, 
or just because of the amount of footage that was generated, I think Matt used the word masochistic levels of footage, uh, you have tools. With access to your media library, you can bring a phalanx of people, a group of people, to bear on this large mountain of footage. So the more that you have access, the more you can kind of turn the tide against um, 700 to 1, 400 to 1, and go more quickly and more efficiently. Um, and we've got uh, nine, nine away playback in the browser, it's pretty, pretty rad. Uh, we've got banking up to 18 cameras. You can uh, drop markers, you, you know, producers can simply look at the footage that they want in a group clip, drag it into a sequence. No real need to manage a bunch of audio tracks, you just kind of drop it in and say, hey look, here's a sequence from my editor. This, these are some of the essential shots from what we shot the other day or for this episode that I think absolutely need to be in the show. It's kind of a starting point. So um, again, allowing folks to contribute on a, on a different level. So we'll go over to that. So on the same system here, I have uh, <coughs> Chrome running. And uh, this is the same UI that um, Ian was showing. And I can uh, basically switch cameras here and be multicam editing in the browser. So I can cut this down. And now I'm looking at my cut as I cut down here. And we can play this back. And I'm also able to add markers, as uh, Ian was saying. So on the fly here, I can add markers. You know, kitchen's shot. And all of this data, you know, the minute I save this, all of this information is immediately available to any of the editors that are on Interplay. Um, so the media composer folks can take this um, uh, down, and it's I mean it's instantaneous, and that's one of the differences between being in central and you know working in media composer, where you can sort of take stuff down from Interplay and work offline, and then you decide what you want to check back in. But when you're working here, it's all live; everything's happening live. All the metadata, the editing, and everything. When you save something, it's immediately available to anyone in uh, in the facility. Yeah. So. Um Again, this is this is footage playing back from Boston. So, um, uh, for folks who have to commute in a big city in, in New York, um, you know, it could be pretty cool to have uh, folks who have to commute for two hours a day spend those two hours actually working. Um, uh, those sorts of things. We'll talk about the benefits of remote work for in a second. Um, again, uh, I think uh, Interplay Central and Media Composer are, are are companions. We've built them to be companions. So it's really just a question of skill set of who on staff is uh, doing what task at what time. Central is very uh, modular, and you can swap out any of the tools that you need at any one time. This happens to be you know, a nice tool set for someone who's working on a reality television uh, producer, a logger, for example. One of the things that we really wanted to accomplish with uh, Central uh, and this relationship that we want to build uh, between Media Composer on the left-hand side and Central on the right-hand side, you can imagine that you've got an editor working on Media Composer and you've got a producer or a logger or an assistant or a uh, transcriptionist working on the with Central is that we've built a chat window uh, here on the side. You can kind of see it right here. And, uh, the same chat window exists within Central. What's cool about this uh, messages pane is that producers um, can search for footage and put a link basically to that footage and send it directly to their editor and vice versa. So you can enable a conversation between two uh, across the different UIs or among them. Uh, the idea here is that um, rather than waiting for review and approval to have and be locked into one big posting, if you're working with a producer internally at the production company as opposed to the network, and you really just kind of look at a motor through uh, a cold open or something like that and want to choose the right shots, well, producer can look for footage while the editor is slowing away on Act 4. Producer can kind of find the shots and say, hey, look, this cold open would be a lot better. I think this is the best shot. Let me shoot it over to them. Um, they load, uh, and Corey will show this in a second, they load the asset to the messages pane and, um, and type a text and say, hey, use this at 45 seconds in the cold open. I think it's a great shot. The editor just double clicks on the asset card and loads immediately in the source window. So there isn't a question about, hey, let me put an ABB file on a, in an email or put it on the server someplace. It's just direct sort of contact uh, with, your, with your media. And uh, that's one of the things that we were looking to do. Again, we kind of want to build this companion relationship between this web-based tool and Media Composer. Again, the web-based tool doesn't have to be outside the facility. It can be inside the facility. It can be anywhere. Um, so that's that's pretty great. So in here, 
for example, this cut that I'm working on, I want, maybe I want the editor to be aware of it, as I said, so I can drag this into the messages window, so I just drop the asset there, and then I just type in the name of the person that I want to send it to, and hit send, and um, now popping back over to Media Composer, I have uh, a messages window available uh, here as well, and so here's the, um, uh, I sort of three messages, and, and then, oh, there we go. Yeah. So there's my updated one that I basically can uh, load, and um, it's going to pull the uh, metadata as well as, so there's the sequence, so I can, um, yeah, so I think, um, we're not actually passing the media. It's not as if it's an attachment to an email. What we're doing is we're passing the metadata link to the asset. So it could be a sequence, it could be a master clip, it could be a subclip, and you can exchange that contact to that media uh, directly. So again, this is some of the things that we're looking to enable and in, in interplay in what we uh, feel like we've done in these most recent releases is, is sort of build this relationship, and it's just where we're getting started. Having a messages service within interplay can be really powerful. So for example, um, if you want to be notified of certain things. So for example, when your editor posts a cut, wouldn't it be cool for the producer just to get a notification that's already posted? Uh, wouldn't it be cool if you had footage that was ingested and now available to the asset library, the team gets notified, hey, your footage is ready. Um, this is some of the forecast of what we see for that messaging service, not only just enabling uh, teams to be more collaborative, but to uh, uh, be able to be notified by systems and machines as well. Really quickly, guys, I just kind of wanted to break down the differences between Sphere and Central. We talked about Sphere is really the service of Media Composer being connected to that playback service. So you have this two-way street between the, the editors in the field and the facility, uh, or different members of the staff, maybe uh, a DP for someone who's doing color management on set. They can use Media Composer to upload stuff back. Central is the web-based tool, and this is how they look. Um, again, Interplay Central includes the mobile clients. We didn't really talk about those tonight, but We've enabled playback service to that. So um, essentially, if uh, an editor is working on a sequence, they render the sequence, they check it in an interplay, it's viewable now on the iPad um, or within a web client. Again, just kind of a quick breakdown of the differences between the two. I think in Sphere, we have Media Composer's tool set there, 424 tracks of audio and video, effects, plugins, AMA, color management. With Central, you're really looking at a, a lighter weight tool set, uh, again, tailor made for people who are. Um, maybe writers by trade or, or otherwise. So I think to kind of ring in with what Matt was saying about crystal balling and looking into the future, um, some of the benefits of remote workflows here, I'm just going to rifle through them quickly. Um, really, I, I think for every, uh, every project, it's about the stories and the characters that you build are most important. So for me, I always look at it as you're allowing the talent best suited for a project to contribute regardless of location. Again, if an editor is out of town, they moved away from the market you're working in, you can still work with them. That's some of the promise of the technology here. Uh, work groups can include, especially talent, like transcription, translation, a better bridge between production and post. Uh, allows a producer who has to go out to the field and come back and vice versa. They don't necessarily have to travel as much because they can still be plugged into the edits that are happening back at the facility. Um, um, you know, just allowing different people to have access. You know, some of the things like promos or Web episodes or press deliverables, there are more people that you can bring to bear on your team to get those things done more quickly. Um, and we've also, it's been pretty interesting. So when I, I demoed um, in, in, at Editor's Lounge, for example, there was like a really active conversation about editors with uh, facility owners and saying, hey, I would actually charge you less if I could stay home and um, take my kids to school or whatever. Um, that there's kind of this idea that um, there might be some advantage for, for lifestyle that people that do this business and we have to be in dark rooms all day, um, it might uh, be some better opportunities to have a life <laughs> or <laughs> have an easier one. And then um, there, uh, there are all sorts of just, I think, benefits of, of that. Just to go back, um, Matt mentioned that in years past, I think Interplay production had been really successful in news and in, uh, in sports. Uh, I think there's 1,800 systems and environments worldwide. Uh, from some of the most aggressive uh, workflows that you'll see from networks and, and, and news and stuff like that. And Interplay 3.0, this has really been our first sort of attempt to take uh, 
uh, take some real progress uh, towards reality intelligent workflows. Um, and we think we really can help because these shooting ratios really are defining uh, of, the, of the genre. And that, that by virtue of the fact that there's so much material, having an asset management environment can really help teams kind of break through things. Here are some of the features that we released in, in June um, that take us a step closer. I just mentioned that Interplay Central has become a default user interface for Interplay. Some of the older clients for Interplay were clunky and old and didn't really look like Media Composer and uh, were hard to use and intimidating to some users that we've, we've talked about. Interplay Central, we, we believe, is much more intuitive. It's much more user-friendly. Um, and people can get up and running uh, as possible. We have multi-cam tools. We have 23, 9, 7, 6 support. Um, um, Interplay Sphere uh, added Mac OS in 23, 9, 7, 6. I showed you a slide of that. We have Sync Projects feature in Interplay now. So those folks who've been working in Media Composer for years on shared storage and really know shared projects and bins. Sync Projects is uh, sort of this, the way that Interplay behaves. It emulates um, that way of working. So uh, we, we feel like we've taken some of the learning curve out of being on Interplay in this release. Uh, we've got, uh, there's a whole lot of AMA, really great AMA work in uh, New Closer 7. We've kind of digested that within Interplay uh, 3.0. Um, so uh, that's, that's good. Uh, group clips, we have group clip support across the board for all the media services, which is really important. Again, it's related to uh, reality television. We have a bunch of 64 bit cording, media services, transcode, uh, a bunch of stuff that more or less just makes uh, 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 these systems really ready and able to support multiple series on one system or um, uh, many multi season uh, programs being in one environment. That's pretty much it for me, guys. I'd be glad. I think Matt had some, uh, some good points. If you guys have questions, feel free to shout them out. Thanks very much for coming.